Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After, a picture e-book. Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian Tsunami. Tonight we will learn more about water and sanitation in part 3 of chapter 13. But let us first recap what we have learnt in the previous book reading sessions before starting tonight's session. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture sensitive food security has also evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, universal health care access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Now let us start with part 3 of chapter on water and sanitation in tonight's reading. Like most of the countries affected by the Asian tsunami, there is no credible documentation of water consumption patterns and water deficit. This despite the fact that the water scarcity plagues most of the countries in the tropics. This is acquiesced in the WHO study called the Asian Tsunami 2004, a comprehensive analysis in its different country reports. Had this documentation been there before the tsunami, for one thing it would have readily served as a reference for shipment of drinking water bladders, water purification tablets and desalination equipment, cartons of bottled water, etc. In the absence of documentation, it is not clear how the disaster displaced survivors managed without access to clean drinking water in the days before aid arrived. This lack of documentation regarding water consumption patterns is a glaring lapse on the part of the country's administrative machinery put together. Apart from documenting water supply, infrastructure, water consumption patterns, it is necessary to document sanitation infrastructure like per capita availability of toilets and water supply in toilets, taps in toilets, quantification of sanitation systems and type of water used in sanitation. This too will help in speedy reconstruction. In the Maldives, for instance, in addition to water supply, the tsunami also damaged the already weak wastewater disposal infrastructure, destroying toilets, damaging septic tanks and blocking sewage systems. An estimated 5,000 toilets were damaged or destroyed and on some of the hardest hit islands, as many as 90% of toilets were destroyed. In addition, 15 islands reported that their sewage systems were blocked. Many septic tanks were damaged when an upwelling pressure wave that preceded the tsunami wave lifted and cracked the septic tanks. The pressure wave and the tsunami waves are believed to have damaged an estimated 1,500 septic tanks and septic tank connections. The tsunami wrought damage to the tune of 13.1 million US dollars of toilet and sanitation infrastructure. A February 2005 joint needs assessment estimated that restoring water and sanitation system would cost 45.6 million US dollars according to the WHO study, the Asian Tsunami 2004, a comprehensive analysis. There is also a dire need for solid waste management and sustainable solutions for waste disposal. The need for this is justified on the account that long-term and permanent solutions can be evolved through sustainable best practices in solid waste management. Who knew three decades, decades ago that a hydrogeological emergency would push and advocate for sustainable remedies in solid waste management? After the tsunami, the Ministry of Environment and Construction was worried that survivors might encounter dangerous wastes 
released by the tsunami and requested that the UNDAC the or the United Nations Disaster Assessment and Coordination conduct a rapid assessment of the environmental impacts of the tsunami. The UNDAC deployed its environmental unit, the UNEP, which arrived on the 28th of December following an assessment of environmental damages, including an assessment of the Maldives Waste Disposal Island. The UNEP worked with local environmental authorities to clean up hazardous wastes. The cleanup effort targeted 100 islands and educated and trained 35 island officials on hazardous waste management. It has been found that the Maldives is in need of emergency operations center, backup communication systems, designated information focal points, emergency shelters or warehouses for storing emergency supplies. In Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, 11 million people lived on the coastal districts out of the total 19.4 million population of the island nation. Being coastal fisher folk living on the coast, their access to water and sanitation was already below the national average. According to UNEP's rapid environmental assessment after the tsunami, quote, inland waters, wetlands and agricultural land fundamental to people's livelihoods were salinated. Agriculture yields will be affected in the immediate future. Shallow wells and groundwater supplies, especially in small islands, are now contaminated with salt water. In some cases, fecal bacteria and damage from damaged or destroyed septic tanks and pit aisle toilets have infiltrated water supply systems. WHO estimates that approximately 35,000 people were tsunami affected population in Sri Lanka. That amounted to 0.18% of its population greater than in any other country impacted by the tsunami, according to the WHO study. Another 23,059 survivors su suffered injuries. As part of the water and sanitation relief, malaria preventive drives included distribution of bed nets by UNICEF and WHO in Sri Lanka. WHO distributed 50 pesticide fogging machines but spent nearly eight times the amount of resources on bed nets as it did on insecticides. IDPs or internally displaced persons living in camps were certainly water staffed in terms of water and sanitation. The WHO study expectedly validates. All 13 coastal districts that were affected by the tsunami suffered damage to the sanitation systems. An estimated 62,000 wells were contaminated or abandoned due to salinity or seawater contamination. 12,000 wells required cleaning. The greatest water and sanitation system damages occurred in the eastern province in the district of Ampara, where there was an estimated US dollars 12 million in replacement costs and indirect losses sites. The WHO study called the Asian Tsunami 2004 a comprehensive analysis. Immediately after the tsunami, sanitation in some camps was poor due to inadequate toilet facilities, waste disposal and distribution of safe water. The number of latrines available was alarmingly low in many camps. This is a recipe for disaster as, have already, as we have already learned from the high tea experience. Ideally, a flushing toilet should serve no more than three people on a per capita basis. In one of the worst cases, 1,135 people had access to only three latrines in a camp in the district of Batikaloa. This was contrary to the sphere standards the WHO study has cited. Until a sufficient number of latrines could be provided, the camp's internally displaced persons were provided with 3,000 squatting plates and 300 showers. Clogged drains also posed a problem. In Gala district, or it's called Gala in Sinhalese, in Gala district, WHO water and sanitation teams reported that water distribution systems needed improvement and that open drains in the urban areas clogged with debris urgently needed to be cleaned. However, the walled city inside the Gala fort was surprisingly spared the cumulative after effects of the tsunami. Water drained off almost immediately in Gala. Such was the design of the water wares and canals. It's a heritage of drainage that the Dutch have bequeathed to Sri Lankans, locals say. Outside the walled city, the tsunami wrought havoc in the city of Gala. 
The Sri Lankan government and aid agencies supplied and distributed bottled water for water and sanitation needs of internally displaced persons. The best practice, as already stated, involves a per capita spread of latrines at the rate of one toilet for every three people in internally displaced persons' camps and shelters. And while NGOs and other humanitarian agencies built a large number of camp latrines to meet the needs, their efforts often were complicated by logistical problems. UNICEF, which had been designated as the lead UN agency for the water and sanitation responses, installed 50 latrines in a camp in Hambantota. In addition, in coordination with the Department of Health and several NGOs, UNICEF provided 125 latrines in three camps in Ampara. However, in Ampara, high groundwater levels complicated latrine building efforts and slowed the construction. Even when sufficient latrines had been built, persons in the camps still face sanitation issues because the agencies that built them failed to provide, properly maintain them. As the disaster continued, an increasing number of gully emptiers were used to suction out and remove human wastes. However, finding a place to dispose of human wastes proved difficult and gully trucks did not always dispose of the waste properly. In response to these issues, the Sri Lankan government, UNICEF and NGOs developed guidelines for the safe disposal of human waste. It prompted Walter Keller, former project advisor of Performance Improvement Project of the GIZ OS Air in Trincomali, Jaffna in Sri Lanka and the photo editor of this book to observe in an exclusive discussion with me, quote, that there are several variables and options in self-sanitizing toilets. It is not entirely eco-friendly and sustainable in terms of water consumption, nevertheless. It might not be practical to use such self-sanitizing toilets in water-stressed areas like, say, in peninsular northern Sri Lanka, unquote. In the district of Jaffna, 715 of its 2,000 contaminated wells were cleaned by 28th of January 2005, says the WHO study, the Asian Tsunami 2004, a comprehensive analysis. There are many versions of self-sanitizing toilets these days. Without endorsing any particular brand, one such can be seen on this YouTube link. It's coming up here sometime here soon. There are many variables and many manufacturers. The concept needs to be adapted to different environments and cultures too, without compromising on standards of sanitation. In drought-prone, water-stressed places like, say, Sub-Saharan Africa, water used for flushing should be minimized and at no cost can fresh water be used for flushing in water-stressed areas. Here's another link. I think they are all coming up one after the other. They are also found in the description box below the video. There are single-use biodegradable toilets too. Adaptations help. Another search result espoused by the GIZ, the German International Cooperation, can, can be found on a particular link that's being put up here as well as in the description box below. I have personally witnessed the functionality of a self-cleaning toilet rim in Germany. Uh, like all things German, the standards involved are worth emulating. The self-sanitizing German toilet involves a flexible WC rim or a toilet seat which automatically sanitizes the rim with disinfectants and toilet cleansing agents, dries itself, covers the rim with recycled paper and presents itself as a freshly disinfected rim for the next user all within three minutes after the last flush. The sight of its optimum functionality created an excited fluster among Australian tourists. My mother got so scared that she thought her, she has lost her vision. So incredible was the super self-functioning spick and span toilet in a roadside traveler's kiosk in Munich in Germany. Such self-sanitizing WCs can be especially useful to frail and infirm and wheelchair-bound users, some of whom may need WCs designed on the wheelchairs itself. Coming back to Sri Lanka, however, cleaning the wells proved to be a more complicated task than some had anticipated. And not all well cleaning efforts were successful. Many of the humanitarian workers who attempted to clean the wells did not have the required skills and the wells remained salinated even after having been repeatedly emptied and cleaned. In some cases, the cleaning process did more damage than good. 
wells collapse or new contamination problems were introduced sri lankans faced severe shortage of drinking water as well as as wells were rendered saline and the risk of pathogens creating health hazards increased in the days and weeks after the tsunami drinking water sources also faced other sources of contamination given the damage that the tsunami wrought on sanitation systems in the coastal districts affected by the tsunami resilience of the vulnerable coastal populations in sri lanka decreased in the aftermath of the tsunami because the tsunami ravaged public health facilities like vaccination storage systems imperiled power supply infrastructure to an already conflict ridden economy on the 8th of january an outbreak of diarrhea was reported in the batikalova district however when relief workers distributed chlorine for treating the water the incidence of diarrhea dropped and the outbreak was controlled within 2 days the who study the asian tsunami 2004 a comprehensive analysis has said without adequate water and sanitation it has led to increase in instances of diarrhea and consequently lesser absorption of nutrients in food sources and consequently malnutrition this is documented by the who's tsunami impact analysis for a country that enjoys sustainable food security in food and fish production some believe that sri lanka's malnutrition issues are the result of poor food quality rather than quantity other factors believed to have contributed to high malnutrition include poor sanitation in some areas which can result in illnesses caused by parasites that reduce the body's ability to absorb nutrients and poor public education on on good nutritional practices the who report says here again we see the cause and consequence that create disaster situations often the causes are natural or geological humanitarian agencies widely distributed supplies to survivors and relief workers to prevent the transmission of waterborne diseases the canadian red cross provided 80000 hygiene kits each can provide for the hygiene needs of a family of up to 6 six, six people 37440 body water containers and 770000 water purification tablets or sachets enough to treat 15 million liters of water by november 2005 un agencies had provided 100000 chlorine tablets 500 chlorine testing kits 30 bacteria testing kits and 900 sanitation kits distributing bottled water is not very sustainable over over a period of time as it demands logistical support and dispenses with local traditions of rainwater harvesting and sanitizing local sources of potable water but bottled water distribution is to some extent inevitable in the aftermath of calamities bottled water also creates unparalleled challenges in solid waste management best practices therefore would be reusable metal containers like steel or copper glasses meant to hold and drink water from in south asia this also enjoys cultural sanction but then again cleaning and sanitation cannot be compromised upon Disposable stuff like paper cups or plastic cups have created enough din in the absence of best practices for solid waste management in all emerging economies across the planet. There is no need to add to the problem. The menace of non-biodegradable containers like plastic cups have burdened and clogged drains, adding to the problem of sanitation. So the best practice indeed is steel or copper cups and containers without compromise on cleanliness. The tsunami scattered an estimated 900,000 metric tons of debris along the Sri Lankan coastlines. In impacted areas, an already weak waste management system collapsed and waste was dumped indiscriminately, thereby compounding environmental health hazards. Tsunami scattered debris such as tires, pans, plastic water bottles, boats, oars, etc. left many new places for rain to collect. and hence increase the potential for mosquito menace the danger of transmission of malaria and dengue fever increased additionally scattered debris including broken glass and scattered bits of sharp metal posed new injury hazards and health wastes became a problem this is how cause and consequence build up to create disaster situations 
In the aftermath of calamities, it does not take either rocket science or a disaster of the scale of the Asian tsunami to practice high standards of solid waste management indeed. In Thailand, in Thailand, seawater from the tsunami was the source of injuries and fatalities. A total of 8,327 8, people are believed to have died. The tsunami killed 2,392 foreigners from 36, 37 countries and approximately 6,000 Thai nationals. In addition, an estimated 91,638 Thai nationals lost a family member or home to the tsunami waves, according to the WHO estimates. Along Thailand's 960 kilometers of Andaman coast, wave heights were highest in three provinces, Sangna, Phuket and Krabi. These places also accounted for 8,146 of the 8,327 lives lost to the tsunami. In Fangna province, the highest waves occurred in Khao Lak district, where tsunami waves reached more than 10 meters high and killed more people than in any other district. In the Khao Lak area, tsunami killed, more than, killed about 3,000 people out of 15,000 people. In resorts and other buildings near the Kaulak shore, the tsunami waves blew out walls on the first and second floors. In Phuket province, highest wave heights of 5 to 6 meters occurred along Patong Beach, the province's most popular beach. In the Krabi province, the tsunami most acutely impacted PP Don, where one area was hit by the tsunami from two directions. The island is shaped like the letter H, like the English letter H. And when the tsunami arrived, it completely inundated the center of the island from both the north and the south with waves that were more than 5.8 to 4.6 meters high. The UNEP report says there has been no report of major water distribution disruption in the six affected provinces. However, water was found contaminated with coliforms bacteria or chlorine in a significant number of wells in Fangna and Phuket provinces. Medical reports following the tsunami suggest that most of the injured suffered open wounds and or respiratory complications ranging from mild lung inflammation to serious infection caused by near drowning according to the WHO study. The breakout of diarrhea was the inevitable fallout of displaced survivors facing deficit in water and sanitation in camps as well as, the, as was the case in all Asian tsunami affected coasts. Both no, sorry. Between 26th December and 11th January 2005, that is, the reported incidence of diarrhea was about 1.7 times higher than it was for the same period one year earlier, that is about 2,950 cases per 100,000 compared to 1,758 cases per 100,000 as per statistics provided in the WHO study. Waterborne diseases on account of spread of malaria and dengue carrying mosquitoes were another threat brought out by the disaster. After the tsunami, an unusual number of dengue outbreaks were reported, but these were not believed to have been related to the Asian tsunami. Thailand had high levels of access to safe drinking water and improved sanitation prior to the tsunami, and the disparities between urban and rural access were small. As of 2000, the year 2000, 91 to 97 percent of the population had access to sustainable, improved water sources with greater access among urban populations than rural populations. Thailand's urban population enjoyed 99.5 percent access to clean drinking water and sanitation, according to the WHO study. Access to ample rainwater harvested accounted for lack of water stress, the WHO study cites. But sanitation infrastructure in the tourist areas on the Andaman coast of Thailand was affected severely by the disaster. The tsunami damaged 19 water supply systems, costing an estimated 615,860 US dollars in direct damages. In Khao Lak, the tsunami flooded the Phang Na Navy Base water treatment plant, damaging electric controls and the emergency generator, which was rendered useless. In the Kamala Beach area of Phuket, tsunami was tsunami damage disrupted water services for nearly three weeks. Although the tsunami damaged seaside pumping stations, pipes, and sanitation infrastructure, 
that was located near the shore wa core water distribution systems and water wastewater treatment plants remained largely intact says the who study determining the amount of damage to groundwater and surface water sources proved difficult since there was little information on the quality of these fresh water sources before the tsunami however a survey of groundwater and surface water qualities in villages in the takwa par district found that bacterial and salt, salt water contamination were considerably higher in those areas inundated by the tsunami than in non inundated areas the survey measured high contamination levels even after 2 months following the tsunami by which time most of the sampled wells had been cleaned and chlorinated at least once Similarly a ministry of public health analysis of well water in Thailand's six impacted provinces found evidence of both salt water and bacterial contamination including significant groundwater contamination in Phangna of the 530 wells that the ministry sampled for bacterial contamination 187 were found to be unsafe due to high coliform bacteria levels Of the 534 wells sampled for salt water content, 32 or 6 percent were found to be unsafe. The WHO study has documented. In addition to damage to fresh water supplies and infrastructure distribution, the tsunami also resulted in damages to sanitation infrastructure. In Phuket, the tsunami damaged two municipal wastewater treatment plants. The tsunami is believed to have contaminated an estimated 2,324 shallow wells. 737 groundwater wells or ponds and 102 surface water ponds in the tsunami impacted areas low availability of water for washing reportedly led to skin problems in some areas impacted by the tsunami the in thailand a unique enterprise by affected internally displaced persons to recontaminate polluted wa- groundwater with chlorine tablets commenced replication UNICEF provided the Bureau of Water Management Resources with 11 mobile drinking water treatment plants that could be used to respond to future emergencies. Given that Thailand had enjoyed 99.5% water and sanitation, it already has an inherent resilience to the tsunami included induced disaster in that the water and sanitation infrastructure despite some damages was still functional despite the occasional outbreak of dysentery or diarrhea that in a sense is the disaster preparedness of the on the front of water and sanitation in disaster struck areas the best practices in water and sanitation interventions in disaster struck areas are a fl- one flushing toilet must serve a maximum of 3 persons in disaster shelters recycled or treated water or grey water must be used for flush tanks Toilets must be automated for self sanitation after every 7 flushes in shelters. Toilet cleansing agents must be made available to identified volunteers who take up the responsibility of having toilets washed and sanitized every hour when shelters are occupied during calamities. If volunteers from the communities affected take up responsibility of sanitizing toilets in shelters, awareness is automatically generated amongst first responders. Uh, that is the sh- stakeholders that will also lessen the burden of the municipal authorities in the disaster struck areas tsunami inundated hinterlands in india indonesia thailand sri lanka and the maldives uh, which were dotted with decomposing corpses and cadavers of livestock and they had to be fumigated to prevent vectors and viruses from colonizing water logged areas Breeding grounds of such vectors and viruses increase the threat of disease among survivors. There is an urgent need to fine tune and hone best practices in solid waste management so that non-biodegradable wastes like plastics do not clog stormwater drains. In the Gall of Fort in Sri Lanka, drainage infrastructure was the one feature which helped the city. Invading sea water drained quickly thanks to the Dutch designed drainage. It helps to avoid usage of disposable plastic and paper cups or containers on account of lack of standardized manufacturing stipulations and lack of defined legislation in solid waste management. Best practices therefore would be reusable metal containers like steel or copper glasses meant to hold and drink water from. In South Asia this also enjoys cultural sanction. But then again cleaning and sanitation cannot be compromised upon. Disposable stuff like paper cups or plastic cups have created enough din in the absence of best practices for solid waste management in all emerging economies across the planet. 
there is no need to add to the problem. The menace of non-biodegradable containers like plastic cups have burdened and clogged drains, adding to the problem of sanitation. So the best practice indeed is steel or copper cups and containers without compromise on cleanliness. In this chapter, an attempt has been made to draw anecdotes from the reports of disaster management from countries affected by the Asian tsunami. From these anecdotes and records of events and extrapolation of data, we, have, we hope the best practices evolved offer credibility and authenticity. It is hoped that the lessons learned can be practically replicated so that the documentation serves its purpose and others do not have to replicate the suffering. Instead, learn from lessons uh, in other disaster struck areas. And that is all for tonight. With this, we have finished chapter 13 on water and sanitation. The next chapter is about the impact of the tsunami on agriculture, change in cropping patterns and impact of climate change. But then I will be traveling again on assignment from the 18th, that is Monday, next Monday, October 18th to 31st of October. And my assignment ends on 30th November. So I think I will have to take a break. I will try my best to put up the videos and do the interactive sessions. But do please do bear with me. Please don't forget to tune in for the live interaction at around 7.30 p.m. Indian time on Saturday evening, 9th of October 2021. I hope to catch you all live during the live interaction. Until then, take care, keep smiling, stay safe and stay home. Ciao.